This panel was scheduled as a two-on-two -two, uh, debate uh, with two people who are uh, critical and skeptical of Vasibir and two people to uh, advocate it. Uh, and they have not shown. However, we will have the discussion so you'll understand why they didn't show. <laughs> okay. um, and I have to say, uh, in case anyone thinks that this is not fair, this is super fair. In my entire career in aerospace, I have never had a critic invite me to come and defend my ideas at their conference. Ever. Okay. Um, I have never been offered equal time. In fact, I've never even been informed of where and when such criticism would be made. Um, so uh, I have tried to treat uh, the Vasimir people with uh, the absolute utmost uh, rigor and fairness. I published my criticism of uh, them in the Space News. Um, so it was made public, it was done in writing, it was not behind their back, and I invited them to come here and rebut. They have not. Okay, so the consequences will have to be upon them at this point. Okay, now, before I begin, I, I want to explain, though, why this is an important issue. I mean, so what if Vasimir doesn't work? Okay, there's a lot of things NASA wastes money on. Uh, well, why be so upset about this particular thing? Um, well, here is a parable that I, I want to give you so you can understand the situation that we're in. Uh, imagine that you're a young man or woman, perhaps in high school, of a lower middle class family. Uh, and uh, y your dream is to be the first member of the family ever to go to college. Okay? And your hard-working mom and dad have put aside a college fund through saving and scrimping over the years so you could go to college. But then your mother dies, and your father remarries, and your evil stepmother takes the college fund and runs off to Paris and spends it all on $1,000 a bottle of wine. And then you still might make it to college by winning a scholarship, but she throws out your science project. And you still might make it by starting a new science project, but she laces your food with LSD. <laughs> okay. Well, that is the current situation. Allow me to explain. You are NASA. The evil stepmother is the Obama administration. College is Mars, okay? The trip to Paris is the stimulus bill, okay? The science fair project was the Bush Moon program, and the LSD is Vasimir. <laughs> That's how this works. And, okay, we have a situation where we have an administration that came into office in its first year, blew the federal budget to smithereens, and racked up enormous bills that were going to come due sooner or later. Okay? And they're coming due. Okay? Politically, as you can see if you've been following the news recently. So we've got a tidal wave of budget cuts coming. Okay? So there went the college fund. Okay? So... The Science Fair Project, NASA having a program that could allow it to win its own support in the face of the tidal wave and still get funded by having a human spaceflight program that was defensible, that'd be worth fighting for, that people would support despite the bad climate. In the second year, Obama canceled the Bush Moon program. Now, the Bush Moon program was weak precisely because it was so easy to cancel because it had such limited amounts of public support, because it was a moon program, not a Mars program. But at least it was an objective. At least it was saying, here's what we're going to do. And in 10 years from now, if you fund this, there'll be Americans walking on the moon. Right? right now, NASA's program is, if you keep giving us $10 billion a year, 10 years from now, nothing much will happen more than is happening right now. Okay? That is not supportable in the face of a budget blitzkrieg. 
Okay? And then finally, the LSD, where someone wants to come along and say, okay, the Bush Moon program was canceled, but now let's do something more interesting, humans to Mars. Say, well, we can't do that until we have warp drive. Um, and, uh, and there it is. Um, it makes, and, and we'll discuss this a little bit more as I get into the presentation. Okay. But first, okay, some basic facts about electric propulsion. It's limited by electrical power, which comes at a premium in space. Now, here's your basic equation. Okay, thrust is mass flow times exhaust velocity. Okay? Jet power is mass flow times exhaust velocity squared divided by two, which works out to thrust times exhaust velocity divided by two, which means that thrust, okay, I, oh, I left out the efficiency factor there in that equation, so, is two times efficiency times the electrical power divided by the exhaust velocity. So the higher the exhaust velocity, the lower the thrust, okay? That's important. Electric propulsion aims for very high exhaust velocity. That tends to lower the thrust, and the thrust is lowered even more by the fact that the only power available is the electrical power system, or some fraction of it defined by the efficiency. Now, we have electrical propulsion systems today called ion drive propulsion systems. They work. They've been tested for thousands of hours, both on the ground and in space, and they get 70% efficiency. So in as much as a electrical propulsion can do something for you, we've got it. And it's not the silver bullet to send us to Mars. Is Vasimir superior to this? Well, uh, in their most recent paper, they claimed, the Vasimir group, um, claimed that they have achieved 70% efficiency, which would make them equal to the ion drive okay, at 5,000 seconds ISP, which is a typical ion drive efficiency. Um, but it's really very doubtful that they did this. And by the way, this was only in a burn lasting a couple of seconds, whereas the ion drives have been tested successfully for thousands of hours, okay? Uh, the, the reason why this is doubtful is because the argon atom moving at 50 kilometers a second, which is 5,000 seconds ISP, has an energy of about 330 electron volts. According to the Vasimir paper, it costs them 100 electron volts just to make the ion. So if there were no other losses in the system at all, they'd have a maximum theoretical specific impulse of 77%. Slightly better than ion drive, though hardly worth shouting about. Actually, 100% would hardly be worth shouting about. But nevertheless, there it would be fine. Okay. However, there are plenty of other losses in the system, including power conditioning losses from the uh, power reactor to bring it to the kind of power that's needed to power the uh, radio frequency heaters, which are used to heat the plasma. The Vasimir engine is basically what's known as a, a magnetic mirror in which you have a chamber in which there's a plasma and there's magnets at each end, but one end is more leaky than the other, so most of the plasma goes out that end, and they heat the plasma with radio, basically microwave heaters. Okay, Then there is efficiency losses in generating the microwaves. Then there's efficiency losses in coupling the microwaves to the plasma. Then there's efficiency losses in thermal radiation from the plasma, in line radiation from the plasma, in Bremsstrahlung radiation from the plasma, in plasma leakage to the walls or out the, the wrong side of the magnetic mirror. Okay? Um, there's uh, what's known as cosine losses, which is the divergence of the plume as it exits the nozzle. Okay? And then there's magnet power which they don't even take into account at all. In fact, one of the reasons why they can only fire the thing for a few seconds is they don't have enough cooling power to keep the, the thing running for more than a few seconds. Their magnets would melt. To operate in space, they would need high temperature few, uh, um, superconducting magnets, which don't exist. Okay, so there, there you go. Um, now, once again, in their paper, which you can find, it's AIAA uh, 2011 1071, uh, they, they claim that they got a 70% uh, efficiency or 72 or something. But if you actually look closely at the data in the paper, and in particular Fig 21, where they actually give a thrust distribution curve, um, and you integrate out the total amount of thrust that they have, it comes to 2.4 newtons, 
which is like half a pound of thrust. Uh, and this was done with a mass flow of 107 uh, micrograms a second, or milligrams, rather, uh, a second, and a power of 108 kilowatts. Well, if you work out those numbers, what you find is that they had a specific impulse, not of 5,000 seconds, but of 2,500 seconds, and they had an efficiency of 28%. Okay? And this is the data in their own paper. Okay? The, uh, furthermore, other data in the paper, and this is very interesting, shows that as you move downstream from the throat, the thrust uh, density of the plume falls exponentially. And this is not characteristic of a well-collimated rocket plume. It doesn't happen. A rocket plume is going more or less straight. Okay, it's only diverging slightly. And the thrust density downstream should not be falling exponentially. It should fall a little bit, but not exponentially. And what this is suggesting, actually, is you see you have a magnetic nozzle and there's magnetic field lines which are diverging outside of the throat, but they come back around and hit the chamber. Okay? And this, by the way, was the weakness of Vasimir that was suggested by one of its uh, original reviewers, Richard Gerwin, the top theoretical plasma physicist at Los Alamos, where he said that the plasma is going to stay on the magnetic field lines, are going to come around and hit the spacecraft. Okay, in which case you get no thrust. Okay, so that's, you know, the jury's still out on that one, but even taking where they put the thrust measurement very close to the throat so the thing hadn't had time to diverge yet, they're looking at an efficiency of 28%, a third of what we can already do. Okay. The, um, so the Vasimir does not represent a breakthrough propulsion system. It represents a variant on electric propulsion systems and worse than the ones that are already well demonstrated. Okay. But it's been fetishized. But what's the real problem here? The real problem is not that NASA is wasting some money on an inferior gadget. Okay? The real problem is that it is being used as an excuse not to commit to go to Mars. Because they're saying, oh, we have this miracle technology, Vasimir, that will let us go to Mars in 39 days, and we'll come to a discussion of that very shortly. Um, and so we should hold off on trying to do Mars missions until we have, you know, warp drive. Um, and in fact, we can't do Mars missions until we have that because the dangers of space travel, unless we can travel really fast, are just too great. And the Vasimir people, in particular, Dr. Chang Diaz, have been uh, all over the place spreading this. And this is not just something that has been adopted by cautious bureaucrats who want to have an excuse not to have a space program that goes anywhere, okay, although it is that. This is something that is being actively promulgated by the Ad Astra company. And so, for instance, here is Chang Diaz himself speaking in Seed magazine, uh, published September 29th, 2009. He says, with the power close to what a nuclear submarine generates, he's talking here about 200 megawatts, which is 200,000 kilowatts. The largest space nuclear reactor ever built is 10 kilowatts. So he's talking about, yes, with a nuclear reactor 20,000 times as large as any that has ever been built, okay, you could use Vasimir to fly humans to Mars in 39 days. A chemical rocket makes the trip in eight months. It's not quite accurate. We can easily do it in six and a half. Okay, that's eight months of exposing your astronauts to debilitating cosmic radiation and weightlessness. Well, you don't need to expose them to weightlessness. You can rotate the spacecraft, in which case you're not exposed to weightlessness. And we'll talk about cosmic radiation in a minute. By the time they get where they're supposed to work, they're going to be in bad shape, almost invalids. Okay. They'll have to spend big chunks of their time recovering from the trip. That is simply not a smart way to conduct an exploration program. And President Obama, in giving his speech at Kennedy Space Center in April 2010, repeated this line, breakthrough propulsion will be needed before we can go to Mars. It's all nonsense. First of all, Vasimir can't you get you to Mars in 39 days. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, the largest uh, space nuclear reactor ever built was 10 kilowatts, Soviet Topaz, mass of 1,000 kilograms, power, of 10, uh, a power to mass ratio of 10 watts per kilogram. In his mission analysis that he publishes, Diaz proposes a 200,000 kilowatt reactor 
which, by the way, would have to have radiators the size of several football fields, okay, the, um, or more, um, and a power to mass density of 1,000 watts per kilogram, 100 times more than what's been demonstrated, okay? Uh, this is just science fiction. It, it has no relationship to reality at all, has no relationship to engineering. Okay, so let's say, however, I mean, the topaz is certainly not the last word in nuclear engineering. Let's say instead of getting 10 watts per kilogram, we could get 50 watts per kilogram. That's a significant five-fold improvement on what's actually been done. Okay, well, let's take that as a realistic position. Then if sent one way to Mars with zero payload, okay, assuming 5,000 seconds ISP and conceding the 70% efficiency, which they can't get, okay, and assuming they had high temperature superconducting magnets, which they don't, um, it would take uh, a launch mass of about 5,500 metric tons, okay, about 4,000 tons of which is the propellant, okay, excuse me, exactly wrong, 4,000 tons of which is the reactor. That's much worse. That's it's very expensive high technology, which also represents very radioactive high technology that will be up there in Earth orbit. 4,000 tons of reactor, another 1,400 tons of propellant, okay, uh, and then some tank engine structure and whatever. Okay, the, uh, the one-way travel of this thing would be uh, five months, 144 days. Now, in 2001, the Mars Odyssey spacecraft propelled by chemical propulsion left Earth in April and arrived at Mars in October. That's six months. And that was done in 2001 by very old-fashioned chemical propulsion. And we can go to Mars in six months with people. Now, by the way, this was a one-way trip here that we're talking about. The Vasimir being 4,000 tons of high technology is not something that you'd want to send one way. Okay. You, you don't want to just create this gigantic spaceship and then use it only one time. You'd have to bring it back, in which case you'd need more propellant and the one-way trip time would be six months. Okay, just the same as you could do with chemical propulsion. Now, uh, recently, uh, uh, Changdi has said, yeah, well, okay, the, uh, and of course the Obama administration has no program to create any space nuclear power system let alone a 200,000 kilowatt space nuclear power system. Space nuclear power system in the 50 to 100 kilowatt range would be extremely useful, not to uh, enable Vasimir, uh, you know, human space missions to Mars, but you could use it as power on the surface at a Mars base. It would play a critical role. You could also use it to power using ion engines, um, uh, robotic space probes to the outer solar system, and that would be, and, and also high data rates, uh, probes to the outer solar system with active sensing. That would be useful. That would be a practical application of space nuclear power. They're not even doing that, let alone this science fiction version necessary to enable uh, Chang Diaz's claims. Now recently, however, okay, the Obama administration came out and said they want to do an asteroid mission. And they put off, they said, well, we'll do it in 2025. And it has been noted correctly by observers that the date 2025 is very convenient as it puts any actual spending for this mission well beyond the horizon of the Obama administration, even should they win a second term. So that it's just, you know, a talk. Um, but here we are with NASA with its only mission beyond LEO being a talk mission about an asteroid mission. Now an asteroid mission is actually not that hard a mission to do. We're talking about a near-Earth asteroid, not a main belt asteroid. Nobody's talking about going to the main belt. Okay. You could do this easily with chemical propulsion with a single launch of a heavy lift booster which throws a HAB module and a bailout capsule on a trajectory um, that goes from one side of Earth's orbit to the other um, and you pass the asteroid uh, close and you spend some time near it, you deploy some robots to get your samples from it, bring it back to your spacecraft and you go and you hit the Earth six months later, single launch, heavy lift, doom, boom, you do it. If you wanted to, if you just said, okay, let's pour on the juice, let's develop a heavy lift booster. We could, the Obama administration could do their asteroid mission by 2016 if they wanted to, but they don't want to, okay? So they use Vasimir. Now, by the way, it, it, this picture here, there's a NASA picture, and th this bizarre spacecraft you're looking at there is another atrocity known as Nautilus X, okay? 
um, which when I first saw it, I thought it was an exercise by some high school student who, you know, they like to draw big Battlestar Galactica spaceships and say, isn't this cool? No, this is NASA. And the, uh, they got a Von Braun wheel, except it doesn't spin, and they got all kinds of other stuff. And, the, uh, and it's basically, wouldn't it be cool to fly around in space if we had one of these? Um, and so that's another issue, although it's analogous in its own way to Vasimir. It's something that you simply must have, but since you're not going to have, you can't fly. Okay. Um, but it has the Vasimir there. Uh, and these uh, solar panels here, however, are not drawn to scale because um, for the mission that they're talking about doing the asteroid with, they're talking about using 2,000 kilowatts. Now, that is modest compared to the 200,000 kilowatts that uh, Chang Diaz is proposing for his Mars mission, but 2,000 kilowatts, that sounds almost reasonable, except when you consider the fact that the space station solar panels, okay, which are about the size that's shown here, um, are 75 kilowatts. It's the biggest solar array ever built. It costs $300 million in hardware costs alone. They're talking about building a solar array 25 times the size of the space station array in order to do this mission, okay? So that's $7 billion in hardware costs just for the solar array, okay? The, uh, and then if you c compute the, now we assume, I have no idea what Nautilus X would weigh, but let's assume that it weighs 40 tons because we could certainly do a tuna can hab module with everything a crew needs for an asteroid mission for that or less, as well as a capsule. We'll just say that that's the same. I won't blame Vasimir for Nautilus X. Um, the, uh, but then you have the thrusters, another 10 tons. The delta V, when you use electric thrusters, is much more, to do a space mission in general, is much more than that required if you use a high thrust system like a chemical rocket or a nuclear thermal rocket. Um, and the reasons for that are a little bit more complex than I want to go into here now, but it is true. Uh, to escape from low Earth orbit into interplanetary space on, for instance, a trans-Mars injection is a delta V of around four kilometers a second if you're using a high thrust system. If you are using a, uh, uh, an electric propulsion system, it's about 14 kilometers a second, okay? And in this case, I'm talking about the round trip. You work it all out, it's a round trip delta V of around 22 kilometers a second, which they can do because they got high ISP, but nevertheless, the propellant is not insignificant. And you're left with a total IM LEO, which is initial mass in low Earth orbit, of 148 tons to send a 40-ton payload from low Earth orbit to uh, the near-Earth asteroid and bring it back. Okay, the f I wrote here the flight time. Actually, that's the burn time. That's the time simply to generate that much delta V, 546 days. That means the flight time is at least that, but it's probably significantly more than that because there's also coasting. Um, now, if you did the same mission with chemical propulsion, hydrogen oxygen engine, just use a couple of RL-10s, Okay, which you could buy right now, today, for $8 million, $4 million each. Okay. Um, your uh, initial mass in low Earth orbit would be 109 tons, 30% less than the Vasimir mission, and the flight time would be 182 days, okay. total flight time, including coast. Um, this makes no sense. What this is, I mean, look, if they were serious about the asteroid mission, as I say, they would just, they'd give it to the serious engineers at NASA to design using a heavy lift booster, a hydrogen and oxygen uh, injection stage, and a, a HAB module, and they'd go do it, and they could do it by 2016, and they might have a program that would be defensible. Instead, they give it to the Battlestar Galactica fan club at NASA headquarters to design an impossible mission in order to make the mission impossible. And that's the problem. Now, finally, the whole argument that we simply must get to Mars in 39 days and we can't do it because of the radiation dose and the zero gravity is false. First of all, the zero gravity is just false because we don't have to go to Mars in zero gravity. We can rotate the spaceship. That's that. <clears throat> as far as radiation concerned, here are the facts. The cosmic ray radiation dose in interplanetary space in the Earth-Mars regions of the solar system is about twice that and only twice that of what it is in low Earth orbit. 
The reason for this, you see, is that the Earth's magnetic field is not strong enough to block out gigavolt cosmic ray particles. They come in. Okay, we're protected mostly here on the surface of the Earth because of the thick atmosphere. In low Earth orbit, they reach low Earth orbit. Okay, now the space station is shielded from half of them by the Earth, which blocks out half of the sky. So the ISS and mere radiation dose rates are 50% those of that in interplanetary space. Well, there's a lot of astronauts and cosmonauts that have spent a lot of time in low Earth orbit. And here's a list. And if you look at the doses that they have received, what you find here is that there's half a dozen cosmonauts and several astronauts who have received cosmic radiation doses comparable to or significantly greater than that which they would have gotten going to Mars and back. And there's, there's names of these people. Okay? These people are all walking around. None of them have exhibited any radiological health effects. And you want to know something? It wouldn't be expected that they would. Because the radiation dose levels that you see here, each of them, uh, the 80 rem represents about a 1% risk of getting a fatal cancer some point later in your life. So these people have all gotten doses on the order of 1, 1.5% 1 of uh, a, a, a risk of getting cancer. And so if you've got 10 people and they all have a 1% risk, there's only a 10% a risk that one of them uh, would have gotten anything, and none of them have gotten anything. Okay? So this is just fiction. Okay. We don't need to get to Mars in 39 days, and Vasimir can't do it. And so there's no point waiting for this propulsion system, which is inferior to what we already have. Okay? Inferior to existing electrical propulsion systems and much inferior to existing chemical propulsion systems. Okay? In order to do something it can't do, which doesn't need to be done. So, here's the bottom line. We don't need stuff like this to go to Mars. Thank you. I'm Bob Terry, and I, I have been doing uh, this, uh, doing this this kind of uh, chat about Vasimir for uh, since last year, and it wants to register my software. This is the free reader, Bob. <laughs> Just make it go away. Let me X. Okay. All right, okay, here we are. All right. Now, let's see, is there a full screen? Is uh, control? Well, uh, I, I, you, but I think you have a full screen because you have, you, you put those margins in there. I, I think you might as well just go with it. I think people can read it. Okay, well, anyway. All right, but uh, it was just one. Huh? Right, yes. That's what I thought, too, that guy. Full screen mode. Wait. Want me to do it for you? That one? And then full screen. Keep going down. It says full screen mode. There it is. Try that. I think it. That's what you got. All right. Well, anyway. Can any of you read that? Where do I got to hit here? Okay. I think that's as good as this. Oh, that one? Yeah. saying yes. Ah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, 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 I'm. Anyway, last year we again uh, initially invited Chang Diaz or anyone 
to stand for Vazimir, and no one has, and no one yet stands for Vazimir. Uh, and so in the interim, as, as aerospace educator with Civil Air Patrol, I've been giving this talk and talks like it anywhere and everywhere that I can because I'm confronted with bizarre fictions like this little gem entitled Fast, Power-Rich Space Transportation, Key to Human Space Exploration and Survival. So it just strikes me that there's this, this is the, the kind of behavior that uh, um, needs to stop. I know. Well, anyway. Escape. Uh, All right. Well, anyway, I'll go back. Whole point. These are some other ways of saying the same thing Bob did. But before I start that, what I do is that when I'm when I'm trying to convey to people is that, you know, we are all taxpayers and, and participants in the exploration of space, and we need to think about what it is we want our 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 system to do for us. And so, of all the things you can look at to do in going to Mars, and we're confronted with Obama's uh, mission to nowhere quite yet, and, and we're also now confronted with this green, uh, red herring uh, for Vasimir. But I just list here some of the things that you could be doing if you weren't getting uh, called off the track by fast and heavy rockets uh, that want to suck up all your money. So, again, this is how uh, uh, trade space for plasma rockets Source temperature goes up to 30 EV, uh, ISP listed there, and a specific impulse and uh, uh, atomic number of the, uh, of the ion you're using. This is, and here a similar thing in terms of uh, uh, mass per unit time, grams per second out there with ISP and so forth. So these are all things that are similar to any, any electric propulsion has has to deal with this problem because electric propulsion, unlike a chemical rocket, really is has an external power source. A chemical rocket has the intrinsic power that's released from the chemistry. And so that's how you end up moving a whole lot more mass with lower ISP. But electrical propulsion, if it were to do tr tremendously better than chemical rocket, would have to do it by, in, by enticing more mass to participate in that high-speed flow. There's nothing, there's nothing that limits the amount of thrust you could get from electrical propulsion except for the fact that you have a hard time coaxing the electricity into your plasma and getting that kind of mass to participate. If you can solve the problem of getting extremely efficient coupling, then maybe you can get a lot more thrust out of electric propulsion generally. But that problem is for the future. And the problem still hasn't been solved. But Vazimir has been this marvelous laboratory experiment has been going on for 30 years. I've been in plasma physics 30 years. Chang Diz has been pushing this rocket for 30 years. And it hasn't gotten off the ground, literally. Okay. So why is that true? Well, we have a lot of, of, a lot of nice aspects here of a plasma helicon coil to do the ionization. We have uh, then uh, ion cyclotron resonance heating to throw the stuff out the pipe. And hopefully it leaves the pipe. But then it has to detach from the magnetic field, which is a whole other whole other set of graduate students' work. Vast numbers of theses have been written on this thing. We all understand how well it doesn't work. Okay? We, we're getting really good at understanding what its limits are, although you will look, I can look through all these papers here, and I will not see the limitations placed on it. You know, what is the upper limit to how much plasma ion density you can create in the, in the part where you actually ionize the plasma? I mean, in electric propulsion these days, 10 to the 16th ions per cubic centimeter is considered a breakthrough. I'm pretty sure the Vasimir pushing the mass it's pushing is not succeeding in getting that, uh, getting that for us yet. So anyway, this, this object here, the helicon, has the job of ionizing the plasma. And this guy tends to operate at, at hundreds of, of kilohertz. And then the ion resonance heating, uh, again, hundreds of, hundreds of kilohertz because the magnetic fields are very high and they're trying to contain this plasma with the magnetic field and get the magnetic field to push the plasma. So you push the plasma, the plasma pushes back in the magnetic field. The magnetic field has to push back on the metal. 
Now, this is why I come equipped with this bizarre, well, I don't know, just, I don't know, is it bizarre or not? But it's to remind you what happens when magnetic fields and metal interact. If I just drop this thing, it goes very fast. But put the magnetic field into the copper, and it takes a long time to come out. Because the copper is dragging on the field and, and, and training itself in, in the conductor. Now, for similar to the problem with magnetic levitation trains, if you want to actually lift a conductor on a magnetic field, you have to have something other than copper. The best conductor at room temperature, pretty much that we know, you cannot lift the copper on the magnetic field. See here, it goes all the way to the bottom of the cup. Mm -hmm. If I can lift this copper, I can throw the thing up, you know, recoil off the magnetic field, then I might have some way to actually transfer momentum from the recoil of the magnetic field to the metal. If I can't move the metal, I can't move the spacecraft. So when Bob talks about observ observations that the thrust tails off exponentially out here, partly it's because maybe some plasma goes right around back here and is lost, partly it's because if you fire it for a long time, then the magnetic field is soaking into the metal. You're just going to put your energy in, into eddy currents. Copper and the conductors that are there have a, have a sort of a soak-in time of one second for a cubic centimeter of copper. So if you move the magnetic field quickly, if you pulse the magnetic field on milliseconds, microseconds, people do this all the time. Industry is called magnetoforming. Take a piece of copper, pulse the field, squeeze it, make anything you want, you know, shapes. You're fine if you do it quickly. But if you try to do it slowly, the field will leak off into your metal, and perhaps this is part of the reason the thrust is diminishing even faster than you say, or than you might think. So Vasimir has a lot of little little gotchas. So I talk about you know how could it help? What are the leaks and how how well are the figures of merit verified? And we've heard Bob say something very very telling here. They fire it for a few seconds because it's going to soak in the copper. Won't do. <laughs> and how much what TRL can you get for the dollars? Which is the real Call, if you're if you're a person who wants to buy a rocket for your problem stuff, you want to know the tra TRL you can get to the dollar spent. Now, there are some advantages. There, there are good efficiency in RF heating. There's a good efficiency from DC to RF. Variable specific impulses are always very interesting. You've got a 30-year R&D base. You know a lot about this thing, but no matter how much you know, you can't make it work any better than it works. And it's not going to work any better than typical electrical propulsion is working. So the losses, we have radial flows in the vacuum, this cosine effect or, or, or worse, and, and charge separation and accumulation of, of, on the vehicle. There are several papers you hear and hear about ambipolar diffusion where the ions and electrons go together out the back. But that isn't exactly balanced. If you throw too many ions and, and don't neutralize them, and there's no effort to neutralize the charge out the plume of Vasimir, and I've yet to see it tested in a tank big enough that you might see this effect. They tested it in Plumbrook, the biggest vacuum tank on the planet. You might see this effect, but when they test it in a little, little tiny tank they put in, in, the, in the backyard, you're not going to see this effect. And so you could throw charge out there, and after a while, all you're doing is stretching a big rubber band. If you know, there's any net charge thrown out, it's coming right back at you. You've just nullified all the thrust you thought you had by springing on your rubber band. So you have to be very careful to have extremely good neutralization of a plasma rocket. And Hall thrusters and other methods can do extremely good neutralization, but mostly because people spend some time thinking about how to neutralize it. And, and Vassenberg hasn't got to that point yet. So we have the magnetic field dissipation, as I related there. And um, OK. I don't care about the phone. Right. So here, alpha, we talked about uh, as, a, as a kilograms per kilowatt. And, and uh, this was out of a report here where they're going to go to Mars in 39 days. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that Mark, Bob didn't steal my thunder. They were going to Mars in 39 days from L1. All those energy had been spent already to get there. No more. You didn't have to boost any further. But what you needed for alpha was something under one, under one. And right now, alpha sits at 7 or 15, depending on who you ask. DARPA has a nice program in high concentration solar arrays. DARPA will advertise an alpha of 15, 
15 kilograms per kilowatt. Uh, Tim Glover of Ad Astra, when we asked him publicly, he says, well, we got seven, I think. I said, okay, factor two between friends, it's all right. Seven, 15, it's no big deal. He needs one, he needs low, lower than one. So he needs an order of magnitude improvement of, uh, of, of kilograms per kilowatt. And then compare this to a nuclear thermal rocket. The thrust, per, uh, the, the thrust to weight ratio for Vazimer is 10 to minus four. Nuclear thermal rockets, six. Nuclear thermal rocket and get itself off the ground. Never mind, kick to Mars. And here, here so if you want to look at nuclear thermal compared to Vazimer, I mean, I think it's pretty clear what you want to buy. This is the car that maybe gets a million miles to the gallon, but takes you a month to get it off the parking lot. <laughs> this, this may not, not the greatest efficiency in the world. The ISP may be, you know, a, a few thousand seconds as opposed to a few hundred, but it, it will get get the job done. So now the question is, would, and again speaks to, do you really need uh, this kind of thing, uh, like Mars Direct versus the Moon? Long ago, myself, friends of mine just worked out this, this business of how much you need in, in low Earth orbit to transfer to the Moon, various rays. And landing on the Moon and then leaving again, the Bush scenario, that was the worst thing you could possibly do. But, but if you just, and the easiest thing you could do is drop your fuel down from the Moon glom it up in Leo and leave, then you can get to Mars, you put, put a kilogram on Mars for maybe two kilograms, a few kilograms in lower Earth orbit. Yeah, 1.51. If I actually dropped fuel down from the moon to Leo, glommed it into my unit and threw, threw my kilogram to Mars, I could land a kilogram on Mars for about 1.51 kilograms in Leo. That's as easy you have bases on the moon doing that. Well, the point of the matter is you can see this was just calibrated sort of a mass advantage. How much mass could you land on Mars compared to the mass you could land on the moon? So this is just a benchmark, the figure of merit I'm talking about. So what I did in that study, and I did, went back and I extended it along the specific impulse axis. And I looked in that study, and I looked in one place where I asked the kick to Mars, trans-Mars injection. How much would, would specific impulse help me? And how much would it help me just to have a lower parasitic mass on my EDL system? This is the mass fraction for aero capture. And I picked in the other previous thing about 15%, which smaller probes can do. Bigger probes have a little trouble getting to 15%. But in any case, the upshot is, if I look at the mass advantage, which is mass to Mars versus mass to the moon, then if I walk in the ISP direction, as I go past the nuclear thermal, these curves start to get flat. And so I'm not gaining any, any mass advantage when I'm out here in the Vazimir ISP. I'm always gaining mass advantage when I, when I lower the parasitic mass in the EDL system. But I still gain a little mass advantage with ISP in the range of nuclear thermal. So going from chemical to nuclear thermal is a good trade space for ISP and mass to Mars. But Vazimir, even if it worked, is not the proper thing to use for the Mars mission anyway. And it's not likely to work the way you think it is anyway. So, you know, it's a problem that has, has no hope. Uh, it appears to have no hope. I wish these guys would come and defend themselves. I mean, I, I, I applaud Bob for making the challenge. And maybe we should just get charter a bus and drive down to Houston and show up in their parking lot. You never, you never know. Well, we came to Dallas. <laughs> I know, we came to Dallas. They wouldn't even, I could understand, we may have to say a date, but if we came to Dallas. So what I did, I mean, what I, Mar Vesemir is not a necessary condition for humans to Mars. I keep trying to help people understand, and if you agree with me and you want to tell your, tell your representatives that, I mean, I, I do this just as, because the case is just a very nice, simple, logical case. It has, there's no working design capable of doing it. We need two miracles. We need a factor of 10 in kilograms per kilowatt, and we also need a factor of 10 in high temperature superconductors because if I want to move mass, I've got to have a superconductor and I've got to have a reliable superconductor I can take on a planetary mission. So I need two miracles. I got Tim Glover of Ad Astra in public to admit to me that he needed these two orders of magnitude improvement to get relevant. And so it's just not a necessary condition. And we shouldn't let people think of it as a necessary condition. And so I keep trying to help people understand that anywhere I can is my function as an educator. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it.
Okay. So, um, strive to seek to find and not to yield. We'll take questions. Um, I don't think a thousand uh, watts per kilogram is science fiction. Uh, there is a, as I explained earlier, there is a new theory, the widow Larson theory, which Richard Darwin has looked at and not found a reason why it wouldn't work. Uh, they would do an awful lot better than that. It would use nickel and hydrogen. Uh, there would be essentially no radiation. All of the uh, all of the energy would come out in terms of heat. Now the heat would still have to be converted to electrical energy, but the mass of the fuel would be pretty insignificant. Uh, next question. I'd like to em emphasize my backing for uh, Dr. Zubrin's position. When he talks about the size of the nuclear reactor, he gave the mass, but he said that the number is 200,000 kilowatts. That's the same as 200 megawatts, which is the same as one-fifth of a gigawatt. So you're talking about a reactor that's large enough to power... Uh, a population of 200,000 people with, a, with their baseload power. So this is a really huge piece of equipment and it, the, the size of it is astronomically larger than any, any nuclear reactor that we ever, ever imagined putting into space. Even I think the nuclear thermal test, the, the NERVA program, weren't anything of that, of that size. Uh, it is significant that we've just uh, reached the, uh, the second largest asteroid Vesta in the solar system using an existing uh, ion propulsion system which is, produces about as much delta V as the rocket that first launched it, but it's taken years to get out there. So I, I de definitely do support continued research and in, in improvements in ion propulsion. But my current paper, uh, which I'm going to be presenting later this afternoon, uh, relies entirely on standard hydrogen oxygen liquid propulsion. That's all we need. And that, and that's, all, that's all we really need for the entire for the entire mission, all phases of it. Thank you. True. Uh, additional uh, questions or comments, um, sir. This is for Dr. Zubrin. It seems to me that what we really have is a philosophical argument. Uh, I can't believe these people don't could, couldn't look at the information that you've given, said, yeah, we can do that, let's do it. I think they're philosophically opposed. Is that right or is that wrong? No, that's correct. They're looking for an excuse not to go to Mars. Right. And Vasimir is their excuse. One of your last slides on the radiation dosage, you showed uh, two comparisons of dosage achieved uh, with or without shielding. How do you do that, that shielding to protect the uh, astronauts? Uh, well, in one case, um, the assumption was no effort whatsoever was made to use the onboard consumables, including food, water, and propellant, and also other objects like the aero shield, uh, to provide some uh, partial shielding. And the other was assumed that you uh, attempted to make some intelligent use of that. And so the two differ by about a factor of two, perhaps, in the radiation dose. Actually, neither are particularly formidable. Um, and you saw there's several cosmonauts have gotten doses higher than the unshielded dose. The, the radiation doses are um, uh, uh, probably the most studied form of toxicity. There has been more effort, by far, into studying radiation toxicity effects than uh, any chemical toxin that I can think of. Um, it, it's been a sort of huge amount of research since 1945. And so if you're looking at these doses of 50 rem, 100 rem, 120 rem, delivered over not a short period of time. If you got 100 rem today, uh, there's a, a real chance you would get radiation sickness, although actually quite a, a low chance that you would die. Um, but 
a hundred rem distributed over time long compared to the body's self repair cycles, which are about sixty days, um, is like smoking. Okay, it's not like you smoke a cigarette and then immediately catch cancer and die. Okay, it is a, a probabilistic effect in terms of increasing your likelihood of getting cancer. And for instance, for the average American smoker. Um, I believe it increases your chance of getting cancer by about 20% if you maintain that habit for a sustained period of time for several decades. Uh, this is a 1% increase. So that, in fact, if we recruited the crew out of smokers and sent them to Mars without their tobacco, we would be reducing their chance of getting cancer. Um, so the... Uh, so this entire thing is, is hocus pocus. And, and finally, I should say the following. There are propulsion systems like NTR that would make it possible to go to Mars in less than six months, perhaps not 39 days, but perhaps four months transits. I, if I had an NTR, I would not use it for that purpose. I would use it to increase the payload and still stay on the six-month trajectory. And the reason why is this is because the six-month trajectory is the right trajectory to go to Mars because it, it is the free return trajectory. If you're going to Mars on the six-month trajectory, if you want to abort the mission, you can fly by Mars and you'll come back and you'll intersect the Earth's orbit exactly two years after you left it, exactly two years after you left it, which means the Earth will be there when you get there, which is the idea. And, the, um, and so you could bail out. And for instance, you know, Apollo um, 13 was saved because it had a free return trajectory. If they didn't have a free return possibility, the mission would have been lost. Now, if you try to go to Mars faster than six months, you're going to go out further into the asteroid belt, and you will not come back to where Earth is in two years. Now, if you go out an exact certain amount faster, you come back in three years, but that's a worse free return. And then there, you know, it's harmonics, four years and so forth. If you actually had a spaceship that could accelerate you so fast that you get to Mars in 39 days, but then the engine conks out part of the way there, you're going to infinity and beyond. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, it, and you know, the, the radiation issue, too, is such that we have nice uh, precursor experiments dreamed up to look at Mars gravity. Mars gravity by a satellite, spinning the mice and all that. If you wanted to understand what low dose rate was going to do, then you know, please make these arguments that a low dose rate is a formidable threat by doing those experiments because so much of what's done in radiation toxicity is at very high dose rate. Fukushima, you know, 10,000 millisieverts per hour, that's 10, <laughs> all right, that, that's, that's, that's 10 sieverts an hour. You know, one sievert in an hour is a small risk, but 10 sieverts will definitely kill you in an hour. And so the low dose rate's important and it's very unexplored. So I, I, I personally think that a little bit of skepticism as a consumer when people tell you this radiation is extremely toxic is, is, is worth, worth looking into because the low dose rates just aren't, aren't examined that much. Uh, yeah, we had an observation is that uh, basically it appears that NASA is becoming zero risk. I mean, I was at the airport yesterday, and you see these young kids coming out of theater in Iraq and Afghanistan. Trust me, those are not zero-risk situations, and they're making about 1000 bucks a month. So I think that NASA needs to man up, and if it's an extra 1% risk of getting a cancer when they're 80, no big deal. Second observation is that, that basically uh, my recollection when I was at Livermore back in the day was that if you put uh, like 10 or 20 centimeters of aluminum or a meter of water around you, you'd knock your GCR down a factor two. Now, it's, it's been a long time, but my recollection is you can't shield against the GCR. Is that true? Pretty much you can't, because we, we can't put a meter of water around the ship. We don't have the mass. No. But, but the point is the GCR dose is predictable, and it's low. It's yeah. a modest uh, rate. And look, the zero risk that NASA is running with Vasimir is a zero risk that there'll ever be a Humans to Mars program. Right. Yeah, okay. that, that's the, uh, I, I, I actually agree with what you're saying. I think that NASA needs to go one step further and go back to the days when it actually took risks. Well, certainly. I, I, a little anecdote I will share. Recently, I went to an AIAA educators conference, and we all made little simple flyers consisting of two loops of paper and a soda straw. 
Well, maybe these things so they help, help children learn about stuff. So the, the organizer of the conference said, let's go out, on, uh, out here on the balcony, and we'll get down and we'll take a picture of you guys throwing these little flyers into the lobby of the hotel. Okay. So we all got ready, got ready to do it. Whoops, halt. Little flyers could not be shot until corporate legal got involved. <laughs> we don't, as a nation have the balls to go to Mars, quite frankly. And that's going to have to change if we expect to do it. I mean, people in the program, a lot of people individually do have the courage to do it, but as a nation, apparently, we don't. Okay, last question. It's not a question, it's a comment, really, that the after 50 years of working on nuclear power systems, which is really the problem, not electric power or electric propulsion, we know how to do that, we have... The, the best design uh, is a 100 kilowatt system that weighed 4,600 kilograms, which might be able to reduce down to 4,000 kilograms. That's for 100 kilowatts. I don't know anybody who has any technology that could appreciably improve on that. I mean, we're already talking about a reactor that's operating at 1,375 K, pretty high temperature. So when you talk about 200 megawatts, you're talking about 8,000, 8, 8, 8 million kilograms, which is just makes the whole concept meaningless, even if you could do the uh, propulsion part for nothing. Yeah, that's exactly it. That it's completely disconnected from reality, either the reality that's been achieved or seriously uh, designed. Okay, so that concludes uh, this session. We'll now uh, divide up. There's going to be uh, three tracks running in uh, three different rooms. You can see what they are in your schedules. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity.